Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Shall we lift up our two hands to heaven and just worship Jesus? Let's welcome his presence, the presence of the Holy Ghost tonight. He's been out here ever since the convention began and he's here again tonight. Let's lift up our hands and worship him in spirit right now. Just celebrate him, magnify him. We worship you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we celebrate you today. Thank you. And thank you. In Jesus' precious name. Let's give the Lord a big hand of praise. Amen. You may please be seated. It's a joy to be here tonight um, at this great event and to be with our friends um, and sharing fellowship with you. I want to believe that it's been a great time either to and it shall go greater until this convention is over. So it's our privilege to be here, my wife and I and our team all the way from Nigeria. Amen. Tonight, for the time we have, I'll be taking us through a very exciting journey on engaging violent faith for a supernatural turn around. Engaging violent faith for a supernatural turn around. The theme of this great convention is faith to change the world. But only changed people can change the world. You cannot give what you don't have. Only changed people can change the world. Until Peter was changed, he could not become an agent of change. While they were hiding about in the upper room, they couldn't change nobody. But when the power came, then it turned Simon to Peter. Simon is a shaking reed, and Peter is a rock. When that power came, the rock in Simon came alive and he became an agent of change. So until you are changed, you cannot be a candidate for changing your world. It has to begin with you. What you don't have, you cannot give. Only charged people can change the world. It's important to be charged with the power of God that empowers you to be an agent of change. That happened with Peter. And when Jesus came down here, he returned in the power of the Spirit, and then he began to change his world. Until you are empowered, you cannot become an agent of change. And tonight we'll be looking at that dimension of empowerment, and I think it's going to be a very exciting time. Now, if your faith lacks proofs, it's fake. Because faith is the evidence of things who fall. So if it lacks evidence, then it's not genuine. It's not the right kind of faith. Then it's theoretical. It has no root. And if it has no root, it cannot be a fruit. 
So it's so important for us to understand tonight that we're, we're looking at faith from biblical perspective. The faith that changes men who will change their world. And um, from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffers violent, and only the violent can take their portion. So it takes some spiritual violence to fulfill your glorious destiny. You need some degree of spiritual violence to fulfill your glorious destiny. You need some degree of spiritual violence to fulfill your glorious destiny. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, he said, fight the good fight of faith. So faith is no mere talk. Faith is a fight. Fight the good fight of faith so you can lay hold on what belongs to you in eternal life. Because that is what you are ordained to do. You are an ordained fighter. If you are not a fighter, you never become a winner. Nobody wins a prize in any contest without putting up a fight. So it takes a fight of faith to live a triumphant life. It takes a fight of faith. We have the parable, or the story of a woman that needed justice and went ahead to see the unjust judge. And the unjust judge would not answer her, but she kept on. And then this man had to get up to do her bidding. And then Jesus ended up saying, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find this kind of faith on the earth? Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 to 8. There is a kind of faith that we always produce resolve. And it is what we call violent faith. The faith that won't let go until the desired result is obtained. That's violent faith. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 to 8. It is that kind of faith that is missing on the earth today. Because what it takes to manifest that violence is not there. And that's what we're looking at tonight, how to get down there. Scripturally, all children of God belong to the tribe of Judah. Am I correct? Because Jesus called us brethren. So we, become, we belong to the same lineage. And he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 2, 11. He was not ashamed to call us brethren. So we are his blood brothers. We are his blood sisters. And so we belong to the same tribe. And he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. You can't be a brother of a lion except you are one. That means... Every believer has a lion in him. Every believer has a lion in him. And the lion is strongest among beasts and turneth not away for any. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 30. He turns not away for any. Is the rock among the beasts. He does not shift position for any beast. It turns not away for any. That talks about the violent status of the lion. Every believer has a lion in him. And all we're trying to do tonight is to see how to awake the lion in you to maximize all of what God has in stock for you. In Genesis chapter 49, verse 8 to 12, we saw lion, I mean, we saw Judah, described prophetically as the lion's whelp. He said, from the pre, my son, you are gone up. Now, then he went on and said, his eyes will be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Red eyes. Violence. His eyes will be red with wine. Now, his eyes will not just be red, it has to take some wine for that eye to become red. <laughs> Glory. Now, and what we're trying to do tonight is to try to find out these special brands of spiritual wine that empowers the lion in you to come alive. And when that happens, you begin to operate more than a conqueror in the world of conflict. 
And what that means is that you become an agent of change and deliverance for others. That's so important. There is a lion in you. You belong to the lion's tribe. So you can't be any less. You belong to the lion's tribe and you cannot be any less. Therefore, spiritually, we are lions, but the lion in us has to be steered or aroused to manifest. Genesis 49 verse 9. So we must be drunk with some brands of spiritual wine to steer that violent faith in us for exploits. There must be a steering of that nature of a lion that is in us. We need that to get anywhere. We need that to get anywhere. If you check all of those that made it true with their desires, you see some manifestation of violence in there. Now, we wanted to enter the room and there is no space. Tear the roof. What's that? And Jesus saw their faith. Jesus saw their faith. Now, there is no way he would turn his back on violent faith. Violent faith will always secure his attention for intervention. There was this woman that went behind the press and struggled her way through and tore the hem of his, of, of his garment. That's violence for a weak woman suffering issue of blood. Still went through that and touched the hem of his garment and Jesus said, Thy faith. That's some violent faith. Thy faith has made thee whole. Luke chapter 8 and verse 40 to 48. Now, so at every point where you secure supernatural intervention, violence faith is in operation. That's the faith that Jesus said, shall I find this kind of faith when the Son of Man cometh? So we need to come off theoretical faith. We need to come off religious faith and come into realms of dynamic faith that produces results. And that's what I believe the church today needs. We need that element of violence in our understanding of the subject of faith. Now let me quickly try to Put up some definitions here on what is faith. Now, faith is not a religious theory, but a mystery of the kingdom. Faith is a mystery. It's a holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. First Timothy 3 verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Now, faith is not a principle of scriptures. Faith is a mystery that empowers us to gain mastery. Faith is a mystery that empowers us to gain mastery over situations. Think of it. My wife was in the labor room to have one of our children in those days, and then they were contemplating a CS. And I got on the scene. I said, they should hold on for me, I'm coming. And I got on the scene, I said, child, turn. And I turned back myself. Labor ceased, and there was a turn. That child was delivered naturally. It wasn't go come or anything. Now think of it. My wife came, said to me after we got married some three months or four months, and she said she had miscarriage. And I was just coming in from a mission trip, it cannot happen. Now, now, there was something in me I wasn't premeditating. I didn't hear it before. But there was something inside me. Now, listen to me. If you will listen tonight with your spirit, you see, it is only in your spirit that the word of God can become fruitful, not in your head. We need to open our heart to get it. Because that's where it is. Because when you are challenged, it is what is in your spirit that responds. No, what is in your head cannot stand the storms. When the storms rise, what is in your head will fly out. But what is in your spirit will speak out and put you where you belong. Now, hear what I said. It cannot happen. Can I have my foot, please? It ended there. That miscarriage was reverted. 
we had that our first son nine months exactly after. Cancelled. It was clear miscarriage, confirmed by a cousin doctor and everything. But Jesus turned it around. Now you see, it takes some degree of violence to possess your possession. And it's important to know how to generate this kind of violence. So you can get there. It's important to know how to generate this kind of violence. So faith is not a religious theory. Faith is a mystery of the kingdom. Now, faith is not a principle nor a strategy. It is a spiritual force that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. First Corinthians 2, 4 and 5. So it's not a principle or a strategy. No, it's a spiritual empowerment for victory. You are empowered by faith to overcome. For this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Now, faith is an unstoppable force in the world of the spirit. And whatever cannot stop the way against God cannot stop the way against faith from accomplishing its mission. Faith is an unstoppable force in the world of the spirit. And whatever cannot stop the way against God cannot stop the way against faith from accomplishing his mission. For who we say to God, what doest thou? You can't challenge his authority, so you can't challenge faith in God because what faith in God does is to tap into the power of God. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. What faith does is to convert the world to power. What faith does is to convert the world to power. And that, empower, that empowerment is what results in your victory. Faith turns the world into power. Romans 1, 16. And that is what results in our victory. So important, what is faith? Faith is not a gentle stuff, but a violent force. Faith is not a gentle stuff, it's a violent force. Mark 2, 1 to 12. Those four folks carrying this paralytic man came through the roof, and Jesus saw their faith. He said, oh, take off your bed and go. That was it. It's not a gentle stuff. A man read one of our books, one of my books in 1986, and he was dying of high blood pressure and hypertension and was on admission in an hospital where the daughter was a doctor. Then he said on page 20, something sparked. And I said in that book, Satan is not a gentleman, so there is no way to engage any form of softness for victory. As this elderly woman read that, that book, he jumped up from the bed and told the daughter, discharge me, I'm going. Now, that was 1986. By 1996, when I met him, he said, I was the one who shared this testimony with you. This is the letter you wrote me in response. I am still sound and healthy. Now, it was about 70 at that time. It cleared up instantly. Faith is not a gentle stuff. The faith that works is a violent force. There must be some element of violence to find your way through. We have reduced these things more or less to mere theory and motivational speaking. That's not it. It's far beyond it. We are talking about empowerment. We're not talking about, uh, you know, encouragement or something. We're talking about empowerment. There's a word of difference. Faith is not a gentle stuff. It's a violent force. Now, Faith is not a religious logic. It's a spiritual weapon. Above all, taking the shield of faith. So it's, it's a force that can be handled. Take Ephesians chapter 6 verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith and you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. So it's a spiritual weapon. It's not a religious logic. And what it does is to 
guarantee your victory over unseen forces. And these unseen forces are very visible proofs all around us. So faith is the master key to a world of unlimited possibilities. Faith is the master key to a world of unlimited possibilities. If thou canst believe, how many things? All things are possible to him that believeth. All things. If you can believe, all things. Mark chapter 9 and verse 27. All things are possible to him that believes. All things. That's the realm the Lord is taking the church to. Because faith is coming back alive in the body of Christ. Amen. Faith is coming back alive in the body of Christ. And that's beginning with you. Now, listen tonight. As you are here in this world, just open your heart because you are not only being instructed, you are at the same time being imparted. Jesus was speaking and the power of God was being imparted upon the people to heal them. Don't just sit to be instructed, but be eager to be imparted because that is God's ultimate for tonight. And you are going to get it. You are getting it there where you are seated tonight. There is coming an impartation of the spirit of faith upon your life. And the proofs will be everywhere. Now, unlimited possibilities. You know, Jesus said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Then he talked about to say, but if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe it. Now, that means there is a kind of faith that puts you in the same, on the same platform with God. No, no, that shouldn't look blasphemous. It's scriptures. In fact, Jesus said, if you, he said, whosoever believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works. Unlimited. So, your limited destiny is actually unlimited in scope. Now, listen to me. Your limited destiny is actually unlimited in scope. Because Jesus said, the works that I do, you will do also, and greater works than this. Think of it. He also came and said, a greater than Solomon is here, talking about himself. Now, that means he is greater than Solomon, and he said, faith can make you greater than him. That is Solomon, Christ, and then you. Now, please, please listen to me. That is God's word to you. So, to be pressed down, to be stagnated, to be buffeted and afflicted, this is not God's plan. We are far beyond that. Whatever could not hold Jesus is not supposed to hold you down. Now listen to me. I mean, uh, uh, that means something is turning inside someone right now. Something is turning inside someone right now. And don't let it go. I want to get you angry enough. To secure a change you must get angry enough to secure a change we are living far below his expectations far below his expectations listen to this every situation is reversible by faith every situation is reversible by faith. Now you see, they said to Jesus, if you were here, our brother Lazarus would not have died. And Jesus said, your brother shall live again. They said, he's already thinking. He said, stop that. If you shall believe, you can believe, you shall see the glory of God. That is, faith can reverse any situation at any point in time. Is somebody still here? Now, listen to this very interesting story. It happened just last month. Now, here was this woman with a child that was hit by a vehicle, hit and run, and the vehicle went up and carried this child to the hospital. Child confirmed dead, hospital one, confirmed dead, hospital two, confirmed dead, hospital three. He said, no, my child is not dead. 
carried the child home. That was between 8 p.m. and 12 midnight. They were going from hospital to hospital. Carried the child home and laid the child on the bed with herself. Child, you can die. The prophet said we are not going to bury any of our children this year. We are not going to bury any of our children this year. By 5.30 in the morning, the dead confirmed dead child sneezed and come, came back to life. Now, that is violent faith. That, that's not... Now, last Sunday, a woman gave a testimony in church with her dead come alive child in her hand. Now, child was confirmed dead and then she said, no, the hospital said, you are too rude. Your child is dead. So I carried the child, the senior sister carried the child, you know, her own senior sister carried the child and they were going. And then he said, the spirit of the Lord said to her, are you not a winner? Start prophesying to this child. And she began prophesying to the child on the back of her own senior sister. They were at the gate of the hospital. Prophesying to the dead child. And the dead child just back to life. And the two of them were in the church. Now you see, this is the works that I do shall ye do also. And greater works than this shall ye do. Now you see, these folks were operating with what has entered into their spirit. If you got it in your mind, you will lose it. Your mind is the wayside. Your mind is among the thorns. Your mind is on this rock. Only your heart is a good ground. If you don't take this into your heart, you never see the fruits of it. It has to get into your heart. That's what Jesus said. These are real life stories. It's on the net, it's everywhere. It's not that somebody says something. It's all there. But now somebody cannot deal with headache. Another believer is dealing with death. Why? Why the gap? Why the gap? Why the gap? Why the gap? I see God closing that gap up tonight. What is faith? Faith is being fully persuaded of the truth. The prevailing circumstances notwithstanding until the truth triumphs. Faith is being fully persuaded of the truth. The prevailing circumstances notwithstanding until faith triumphs. Romans 4, 17 to 21, Abraham Staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. You know, the Bible says, he considered not his own body, which is now as good as dead. You know, it's the genesis of Sarah's womb, but he believed that shall be as it was told him. What is happening, not, notwithstanding. And Isaac eventually came. I don't care what is being withheld from you for now. Violent faith will bring delivery for you. Now, why do we need violent faith? There are giants in every man's promised land. So you need violent faith to possess your possession. There are giants in every man's promised land. There are giants in everyone's promised land. Where our headquarter church is was a notorious place for witchcraft. Notorious place for witchcraft. But when God said that was the place, that was it. As we arrived, witchcraft had to disappear because light and darkness can't be in the same place. There are giants in every man's promised land. So you need violent faith to possess your possession. Numbers chapter 13 and verse 25 to 33. You have the story there at Kadesh Barnea. Now, so it will take violent faith to dispossess the giants of your possession. It will take violent faith to get that done. And Joshua and Caleb said, let us go up at once. We are able to take it. Numbers 14, 6 to 10. It's all there. In 1979, I read a book titled The Apostle of Faith 
by um, uh, written on Smith Wigglesworth ministry. And I got something there that got me intoxicated. What? The devil is far below where redemption has positioned me. So the devil cannot challenge my authority at any point in time. So I got to a place to minister July of that year. And after ministering, I asked them, are there witches here? Come and stand to your feet. And a crowd stood up. I said, come and sit down now. I'm not, as, I'm not saying that someone called you a witch. I'm saying that you know that you know that you're a practicing witch. Stand to your feet. And a large number stood up. I got excited. Normally one should get scared, but I got excited because I'd been empowered by an, an insight from that book. And I called one of them, come on here, tell me what to do with the devil. And he said it. I said, what when people like us are coming? He said, when we sense a higher power on the way, we clear off the highway. Faith places you above principalities and powers. You can quench all the fiery darts of the devil by faith. Somebody's alive here. No more harassment on your life. No more harassment on your life. Why violent faith? There will always be a Red Sea to cross into your promised land. There will always be a Red Sea to cross into your promised land. Exodus 13 and 17 to 18, or 1 to 18. Why violent faith? You may also have to pass through both fire and the swelling of Jordan into your glory land. There are barriers on your way that you have to dare or you never arrive. If you can't dare them, they will rob you of what belongs to you. So you need violent faith to dare the undareable so you can take what belongs to you. Remember, the enemy will always resist God's plan for you. He said, a great door and effectual has opened unto me, but what happens? There are many adversaries. First Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 9, nine. There are many adversaries. The greater the doors, the greater the oppositions. So you need a heart to dare the opposition in order to arrive at your possession. You need a heart to get there. And that's why we need violent faith. That's why we need violent faith. What are the characteristics of violent faith? What are the characteristics of violent faith? Violent faith is spiritually resolute. Spiritually resolute. Unbending, unyielding, assertive, never giving up on any revealed truth. Violent faith is spiritually resolute. It makes you to be spiritually resolute. Unbending, unyielding, assertive, and never giving up on any revealed truth. It's the if I perish, I perish stance. Number two, Characteristics of violent faith, it makes you confidently restful. Confidently restful. In the midst of the storm, you are at peace. Violent faith makes you confidently restful. Confidently restful. You see, in Genesis 49, he said, He stooped as a lion, he coached. And as an old lion, who will rouse him up? You don't see an anxious lion. <laughs> Every time he notices a movement, he turns. <laughs> because no one can dare him. He turns. You are confidently restful yes, in the midst of conflict, mm. as if they are not real. Someone asked me years ago, Brother David, do you ever have problems? I said, maybe it came, I didn't know. <laughs> maybe it came, somebody can introduce himself to you, and if you have anything doing with him, you may not know. You forget almost immediately. Maybe it came, I didn't know. 
Do you ever have problem? Maybe it came I didn't know. Violent faith makes you confidently restful. Just picture a lion in the forest. Another character of violent faith is violent posture. Even your look sends fear to the devil. Even your look sends fear to the devil. Violent posture. You are not looking beggarly. You are constantly charged. Violent posture. Violent faith also goes on the offensive. It's not hanging around. He said, from the pre, my son, thou art gone up. From the pre. It's always on the offensive. It's not trying to defend something. Something comes around, he pursues it. You can't stop that. It's offensive. What you don't want, you don't watch. Whatever you don't resist has a right to remain. What you don't confront, you cannot conquer. Violent faith is always on the offensive. Always on the offensive. You saw how Peter reacted to Simon, the power of God. He said, stop that. Your money perish with you. Violent faith. You saw how Paul responded to Elimas. You shall be blind for a season, not send the light. Always on the offensive. Violent faith is never beggarly. It's always on the offensive. Another um, characteristic of violent faith is it makes you supernaturally bold. You are, not, you, are, you are not trying to look for a way of escape. You possess the land. You plant your feet. One of those great men of David, they said he dug the ground and put his two feet and buried it there. No movement. Anybody coming from the front, from the side, from behind, he was one of the mighty men of David. Supernaturally bold. I decree the release of that spirit of boldness on your life. You are bold, you are fearless. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, what is it that empowers the violence in us? Now, I'll be taking us through some seven brands of spiritual wine. When you take them, the violent man in you comes alive. And that puts you supernaturally in charge of situations. Listen to me, and I'll put it, a lot of testimonies in there to help empower our understanding so we can know what it means. Now, when the Holy Ghost came in the upper room, Peter stood up and said, these men are not drunk as ye suppose. What does that mean? That means there are wine genes in the Holy Ghost. Because they were operating like drunken men. As of the Apostles chapter 2 and verse 14 down the line. He said, they were not drunk, I suppose. This is that which was spoken by Prophet Joel, that in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So the Holy Ghost manifested himself first and foremost as wine. And when that wine got into the shaky Peter, he became the rock. Jesus, whom your father's killed, him has got raised from the dead. What? A little girl could stop him just a few moments ago. Now the lion in him has come alive. How? By the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost fires up the lion in you. Gets the lion in you intoxicated. Yes, sir. Turns his eyes red. He said his eyes shall be red with wine. And his teeth white with milk. Thy throne, O God, is forever. 
the chapter of the right, kingdom is the right scripture. Thou love and righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. The anointing was what established his throne. Please understand this. The anointing of the Holy Ghost turns men violent. It turns men violent. You are spiritually violent against the devil and his works. Spiritually violent against the devil and his works. So we talk about the Holy Ghost wine. It's one of the special brands of wine that empowers the lion in you to come alive. This wine is accessible to all believers. All you need is continue to task for it. Now see, the wine of yesterday cannot keep you intoxicated today. No matter how experienced a drunkard you are, <laughs> if you took some wine yesterday and it turns you on and turns you violent, and you don't take for the next one week, you become normal. Come on now. So it's the wine you need on constant basis so you can stay on top on constant basis. You need this wine of the Holy Ghost and how do you gather? Now you see, thank God for prayers, we need that. Thank God for fasting, we need that. But one missing thing we need to know is ministering to the Lord. Entitles you to fresh oil. Ministering yeah. to the Lord. Yeah. Ministering to the Lord. The Bible said they prayed, fasted, and ministered unto, unto the Lord. And the Holy Ghost said. No, see, every time you minister to the Lord in worship, you are connecting with the release of fresh oil. Now listen, Psalm 92 and verse 1. The Bible says it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praise unto his name is the most high God. To tell of his love and kindness in the morning and his faithfulness every night. He said, then your horn shall be exalted like the horn of a unicorn. Verse 10, you shall be anointed with fresh oil. So ministering to the Lord provides you and I access to the fresh oil. Thank God for prayers, we are used to that. Thank God for fasting, we are used to that. But we need to know what ministering to the Lord does. It connects you to the lease of fresh oil. Well, and you know the Bible says, let not your head lack ointment. Let your garment be always white. You must keep the oil on your life fresh. Yeah. And one way to do that is to learn the mystery of ministering to the Lord. Yes. Ministering to the Lord. Yes. And I mean, not just singing and jumping, but as you are ministering to him, you are speaking back to him. You know, mm. I love you more than anything. I love you. Lord, I give my life to you. You are the reason I'm alive, Jesus. I just love you. There is no exchange for you in my life. I don't have no substitute for you. I love you, Jesus. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah, the man of war, his mercy endured forever and ever. I praise your holy name. And you worship him in spirit and in understanding. What happens? Fresh air comes on you. Friends, now the truth is this. Jesus called me about 31 years ago. By his grace, I'm stronger today than I was the day he called me. I've not lost one ounce of spiritual energy. Neither have I lost one ounce of physical energy. There is access to fresh oil if we know what it takes. Thank God for prayers, thank God for fasting, but you don't even know the fresh oil until you learn how to minister to the Lord. It's time to get that done. It's time to get that done. It's time to get that done. We need to get that done. You need the fresh oil to stay intoxicated and to remain violent. So that at any time you are hit, the lion in you rises. Any time you are hit, the lion in you rises and then you are able to take charge. We have the Holy Ghost wine. Everybody needs to know that. That we can assess that. And that fresh oil is available to every one of us. The violent man in you will come alive when the oil is fresh. The fresher the oil, the more violent you are. 
What more? We also know that the anointing empowers of our access into the deep things of God, uh, which is also highly intoxicating. Every true revelation intoxicates. I'll get the under here now. Every true revelation intoxicates. Now, let's go to the next brand of wine, and that is the word wine, the word wine, W-O-R-D. Now, in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1, O oh, every man that tasted, come to the waters. Come buy wine. Come buy milk without money and without cost. Now, verse 11 said, This spake he. I mean, verse 11 said, So shall my word be, which is gone forth out of my lips. So the word has wine genes. Mm. There are wine genes in the world. Now, you see, God's word is in different nutritional levels. There is the water of the world. There is the milk of the world. Somebody hearing what I'm saying? There is the meat of the world. And there is the strong meat of the world. Now, there is the honey of the world. And there is the wine of the world. Remember what he said. Come into the waters, so shall my word be. So there is the water realm of the world. Now, there is the milk realm. Come by milk. Desire the milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. So there is the milk of the world. And then we have the meat of the world. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. He said, The meat which has not profited them that are fed thereby. He's talking about doctrines. So, so there is the meat. Now, Hebrews 5.14 talks about the strong meat, but strong meat belongs to them who, by reason of use, have exercised their senses. Like A. Allen will say, the strong man's gospel. The strong meat. Strong meat. There is the meat, there is the strong meat. When you win a child from milk, it starts on cereal. That is meat. Then after some time, it begins to tear, you know, chicken and all that stuff and fish. That's getting up to the strong meat level. And then you have the honey of the world. My son, eat thou honey, for it is good. That's the honey level. And then you have the wine level. Now, there is no way milk can intoxicate you. And meat cannot intoxicate you, whether strong meat or weak meat. Now, there is no way honey can intoxicate you. It has to be wine. So there is the wine of the world that intoxicates men unto violence. Is somebody here know what I'm talking about? There is the wine of the world. We need to get out of the shallow waters, man. We need to get out of the shallow waters and get to where the stuff is. Get to the real thing. There is the wine level. There are certain things I found, no matter what's happening in the world, I can't drop them because I'm under the intoxicating influence of those things. I can't drop them. So there is a wine level. And now, you see, Jesus talks about the world as the seed. Now, when you run water on grains, it goes through fermentation. Man, that's what they call brewing. Now, the Holy Ghost is the river. The word of God is the seed. So when the Holy Ghost runs on the seed, it brews it. Come on now. It brews it. With the Holy Ghost, teach it. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. By the time he mixes them together, you're off. Mm. Absolutely in command. Somebody's blessed here. Yes, we need access to the wine realm of the world. We need access to the wine. That's when you do as occasions of you. When you get there, you do as occasions. That's you are fully, supernaturally in charge. Somebody's blessed here. Yes, well, it's a brand new day for us. Amen. Come on, shout glory. glory. Shout glory. Let's run quickly. What other wine do we have? We have the prayer wine. What do I call it? There is the prayer wine. You remember the story of Hannah. She was praying. Only her lips moved. Her voice was not heard. First Samuel chapter 1 verse 9 to 17. And Eli came and said, put your wine away from you. Come on, say with me, prayer wine. That is the prayer wine. And uh, the Holy Ghost is also the facilitator of that wine. Because we don't know what we should pray as we ought to, but the Holy Ghost 
make an intention for with groanings which cannot be uttered. And because he knows the mind of God, he prays according to the will of God. So when the spirit of grace and supplication comes, then you come under the influence of the prayer wine. Prayer becomes a delight. You live under his influence perpetually. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about? And when you come under the prayer wine, there is no way you will not get divine attention. Just like that woman, Hannah, got it. She was operating the wine realm of prayer. Only her lips moved, her voice was not heard. She wasn't trying to play fancy of grammar in prayers. She was pouring her soul to God. Her spirit person was reaching out to heaven. And God came down to answer her. There is the prayer wine and I pray that that anointing yes, for prayers, the anointing that prays according to the will of God, that prays in the Holy Ghost, comes on everyone under this meeting tonight. Yes. There is the prayer wine. These are the wines that intoxicates people. Jesus came back from a prayer mountain and the Bible said a possessed person saw him and cried. Hey, have you come to the church before the time? He was just coming under that influence of the prayer wine. The prayer wine was fresh. The prayer, no demon could stand on the way. The prayer wine was fresh. We need that. We need that to go places for Jesus. We need that. We need that. Praying in the Holy Ghost. We need that. It has a lot to offer us. As we pray in the Holy Ghost, light begins to dawn on our path. Revelation begins to dawn on our path. That's what happens. The more we pray in the Spirit, the more violent our faith becomes. Because we build up our faith. We build up ourselves upon our whole, most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now you see, when you pray in the Holy Ghost, what you are doing is just provoking the Spirit of God to show you which way out on that issue. To show you which way out on that issue. Just pray in the Holy Ghost and then you find it. Pray in the Holy Ghost and then you find it. The more you pray in the Holy Ghost, the more violent your faith becomes. Now, let's go to the next one. The next one we're looking at is the testimony wine. Come on, say with me, testimony wine. Testimony wine. Testimony wine. And, uh, you know, testimonies can be highly intoxicated. What drove David to confront Goliath was testimony. The Lord who gave me the lion and the bear, he will give me this uncircumcised feeling today. Don't let go of your testimonies. The Bible says, bind up the testimonies and seal up the law among my disciples. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16 and verse 20. Bind up the testimonies and seal up the law among my disciples. It's so important to engage your understanding of the testimonies of yesterday in confronting your battles today. In the same vein, the testimony of Jesus among the brethren is a spiritual intoxicant. God has done this for this, that means it's available for me. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about? Amen. It's time to get out. The ark of testimony has come back to the body of Christ. Yes. The ark of testimony is being restored to the body of Christ. Every testimony of the Lord is prophetic. Yes. Isaiah chapter 9, I mean, Revelation 19 verse 10, he said, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's a pointer to your inheritance. Every testimony among the brethren is a pointer to your inheritance as yet to be delivered. Listen to this. In Psalm 119, verse 111, he said, Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, and they are the rejoicing of my heart. So every testimony of Jesus is a pointer to your heritage. When you buy into it, it can be very intoxicated. The testimony of Wigglesworth has done a lot in my life. The testimony of 
Copeland, the testimony of Egan. Amazing things. They stir up something in me that it can't be done because he did it there, he will do it here. Now, if somebody see here, what I'm talking about, now, this is so important. There is the testimony why. When I sit down in church and people share testimonies, I shed tears. Something is turning on my inside. See God, see God again, see God again, see God again, see God again. So as you hear testimonies and read testimonies from books, open your heart to assess the wine genes in those testimonies. And when you do, it's your turn to get your own. Most people today in the body of Christ have gotten their testimonies from testimonies of others. Why? They came under the influence of those testimonies and that helps them out. Well, to God be praised. This is one night I believe you will live to remember. Whatever it is that is remaining in our life that needs his attention, I'm sure he will do that for us. Let me close in the two minutes I have. There is the vision why. Because we are trying out to change the world. It takes vision to be a world changer. And it's very simple to understand this. Every true vision puts the visionary on the run. Every true vision puts the visionary on the run. You can't have a word from the Lord and sit down. A word from the Lord will set you into motion any day, any time, anywhere. Jeremiah said it was like fire shot up in my bone. I could not hold it. Every word from the Lord puts you on the run. Immediately I arose and I confirmed not with flesh and blood. Galatians 1 15. Every word from the Lord puts you on the run. Now, quickly, what is in the vision that empowers you to impart your word? One, every vision of the Lord will enjoy the following God will always go before you to anywhere he's leading you to, and anything he's leading you to. He goes before the lead. John 10, 4 and 5, he leads his own sheep out and he goes before them. Now, number two, he goes with you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. If God sends you somewhere, he goes with you there. And if God be for you, who can be against you? That's why only true visionaries can change the world. Only true visionaries can change the world. If you don't have a vision, you cannot become a change agent. You cannot. Abraham changed his world by visions. Everyone who has imparted on the world have imparted on the world by visions. Because he goes before you, he goes with you. He walks with you. God also walking with them, confirming the world with signs following. He walked through you. It's God who's at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And he works for you. Faith we see that called you, who also will do it. And this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Let me conclude by saying, please, watch me. I came all the way from Nigeria. Let me pour my heart out before I leave. Glory to God. Let me now come down to real things. God gave me a vision, and for 30 years, or for 31 years now, has never lacked his backing. We never borrowed from any source or begged or write a note to anybody. Amen. Men, and we are a multi-billion organization today. Yes. By the veracity of faith. Mm. By what? The veracity of faith. Please listen to me. By the veracity of faith. Now, let me say this. Last year, we had 291,000 souls saved in the church. Can I say this to you, folks? God spoke to me, it's time to get the aircraft. Yes. While I was going into a meeting, it was not in our budget. I can tell you this, you need capacity to receive a word from the Lord. I received it and I knew this is God speaking. And I went to the service on a Saturday morning. I said, God just spoke to me, it's time to get the aircraft. There was no mention of aircraft for, to anybody at any time, but just God, God said it. In six months time, the aircraft landed. Debt free, fully paid for. Yes. Now, from 1996, we have been in the air, never off part time. Can I tell you this? When God speaks, everything hears. Ah. When God speaks, 
everything here. When God speaks, everything here. Animate and inanimate. <laughs> when God speaks, everything here. Elements. Inclusive. The sun, the moon, the sea, the storm. When God speaks, everything here. What am I saying tonight? Please develop your spiritual capacity to receive from the Lord. That's the gateway to becoming a change agent in the world. Receive that. It's so important. I have from the Lord that there is no difference between the Jews and the Greek, between the white and the black, the yellow and the green. The same Lord over all his teachers, all that call upon him. I had it and I knew on the spot. I will never need anything from any part of this world, including my country where I come from, but from heaven. And from that time, Amen. you see, it's so important. When light comes from heaven, it puts you in command. My prayer is that this convention will be a platform that will change you forever so you can be part of those who will change your world. This is so important. This is so important. I have seen things happen, and I've seen them happen by the hand of God. May the same hand of God begin to cause things to happen in your life. Amen. This ministry is a platform for faith fire. Yes. All you need is connect with that fire and then you keep moving. Yes. Somebody must be healed already here. Amen. Because the word of God is gone forth and it heals. It delivers. It sets free. Just to let you know, I love you. I came here just to express our love to you. I came here just to share fellowship with my friend. I came here to prove that we are a part of the same family. And I do believe that things are going to happen. Let me have these books, please, and just introduce them in a moment. Got some books here. Yes. That I believe will be of help to us. Experts of Faith. The Unlimited Power of Faith is my latest book on faith. And I guess it will be a lot of blessing to you. And then understanding financial prosperity. The world is just beginning to experience a drought. Man, you can't pray off a prophetic agenda. You can only seek an exemption. You can't pray off a prophetic agenda. You can only seek an exemption. You can't stop the earthquakes in diverse places. So you can't stop the famines in diverse places but you can seek an exemption. And I can tell you, there is no safe place anywhere in the world but in the kingdom. Yes. There is no safe place anywhere in the world, no safe country. Don't let nobody tell me I'm, I'm in America. America is not exempted. You can only seek your own exemption. Every government of every nation is under stress. You hear the news yourself. The economy is shaky globally. But you can secure a place of security for your life. That's what Revelation is all about. Yes. And I believe amazing materials in this ministry, amazing materials all around the world are there to show you the way to exemption. You cannot pray off a prophetic agenda. No. Nation will be rising against nation till Jesus comes. Economy will keep crashing till Jesus comes. The people that are no people will become the people in charge. And that's you and I. So please wake up and seek exemption through revelation. Seek exemption through revelation. Seek exemption through revelation. Now tonight, very important. Salvation is the gateway to abundant life. Salvation is the gateway to eternal life. Salvation is what redeems you and me from the oppression and bastardization of the devil. Salvation is the only way to regain our human dignity. Salvation is the only way to secure eternity with Christ at the end of our journey on earth. I know there are people here in all the overflows that will need to turn back to God tonight and accept Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. That is the bottom line. All that we're talking about faith, we only walk when you become a child of God. He said, whatever is born of God overcomes by faith. So until you are born of God, faith is of no consequence for you. Wherever you are tonight, you want to be saved, um, I'd like to invite you to receive Jesus into your life and watch 
how things begin to change in your life from henceforth. I gave my life to Christ February 19, 1969. I've never had a rethink about what is it? What am I doing? It's wonderful. It's an experience that many of us here have. Most of us here have it. I want to invite you to please come and share this experience with us. It's real. It's no fake. You can experience that today and then be part of that life that is free from harassment forever. That's what Jesus offers. So wherever you are, please stand to your feet. And I'd like to pray with you tonight. God bless you. You want to be saved tonight? Please get up on your feet. You want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior tonight?